What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 4040 Vision Podcast. I am your host, Khaled Abdallah, joined by my co-host, Salman Huck. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, former NBA star Tariq Abdul Wahad is joining us today. Tariq played college basketball at Michigan and San Jose State before being drafted 11th overall in the 1997 NBA draft by the Sacramento Kings. He played seven years in the NBA with the Kings, Orlando Magic, Denver Nuggets, and Dallas Mavericks before moving on to coaching at the college and high school levels. Tark was the first NBA player raised primarily in France and was a trailblazer that opened the doors for guys like Mikhail Petrus, Tony Parker, Rudy Gobert, and many, many more. We spent some time with him today talking about growing up in France, his college career, his journey to the NBA, some of his favorite NBA memories and the guys he had a lot of trouble guarding, and what he's been up to since. Uh, this was a really great conversation, and we're so excited for you guys to check it out. So let's jump right in. Cool. First of all, Brother Tarek, thank you so much for hopping on the 4040 Vision podcast with uh, with us. Uh, as I told you, you know, in our in our uh, kind of pregame intro, we're just going to be talking about you, uh, your journey, your childhood, your college career, NBA career, and then of course anything else that you uh, want to talk about in the meantime. But so we'll we'll start way way back. So. You grew up uh, outside of Paris, right? And both yeah. of your parents were professional basketball players, if I'm not mistaken. So no, that's amazing. my mom was nope. my oh, mom okay. was a professional basketball player, and my dad, uh, my dad was in soccer. So it's not, yeah. Oh, okay. Whatever you read, whatever you read on Wikipedia is not always a hundred percent accurate. There's like, there's the Wikipedia truth, and then there's the actual people's truth like what people okay. actually experience um so no so my dad uh and i'm not talking about my biological father i'm talking about my dad the person who raised me right did okay. you understand the difference i sure um, do yeah. my dad yeah so my dad was uh, in the french air force uh, military guy um and my mom was a started as semi as a semi well Technically, she was never a full-time professional basketball player. She was always considered a semi-professional because she did have a job on the side. But she did play at a professional, uh, at a professional level, so in the, in the top league in France. So she would play European, you know, European Cup and whatnot. But she had a job on the side. She was one of the few players on the team that was semi-professional. Uh, okay, but the club, it. yeah, but the club was... The club where she played was um, was yeah in Versailles, which is about 30, 40 minutes uh, west of Paris. Got it, got it. Okay, yeah. so tell tell us a little bit about your childhood. When did basketball become a big part of your life, and when did you kind of pursue it a little seriously? Yeah, well, well first off, I mean, both my parents are originally from French Guiana, so which is a small French territory. It's not that small, but it's a French territory north of brazil um, they came mm -hmm. um, both my parents came to france when they were uh, my dad came when he was i think he went to the military at 18 and i think he landed in a, on a french base probably in his 20s and my mom went there also in her 20s when my grandma got a job as a nurse uh, in france so originally so i'm i'm, I'm t technically not technically but French Guiana is considered the Caribbean, okay? Even though it's mm -hmm. not an island, it's inland. Mm -hmm. But it, culturally, it's, it's, it, would be, uh, it would be a Caribbean upbringing. So I, basically, my, my brother and I were born in France uh, from uh, French Guyanese parents. Uh, my dad was into soccer a lot. My mom was into basketball, obviously, a lot. And uh, when my parents divorced, we moved with, well, we moved with my mom. Um, but we also, I mean, at the same time, we also went to, I also went to boarding school, but basketball was pretty much the sport I was going to play once I moved with my mom. So I, I, I dabbled in soccer a little bit, then basketball, but when my parents split, basketball was the sport uh, that I was going to play because my mom was, I mean, was playing it. You know what I'm saying? I mm -hmm. kind of grew up watching her play and whatnot. Got and, it, yeah. got it. So you, you played it, of course, growing up. And, and when did you sort of start to land on the radar 
of schools in in the U.S. And can you tell us a little bit about that recruiting process? Well, it's kind of, I mean, that's not. It's it was a, it was kind of a funny funny experience. Uh, I got very. I mean, Allah Azawajal really wanted me to get to the U.S. somewhere somehow because. I was playing for that club, and then, you know, you get better. You play for your local club. Then you play for the team in the region. Then by the, by the age of uh, 19, I had made the uh, – uh, 18, 19, I had made the uh, French national team. So I went to a camp. Uh, we had a, actually a qualification tournament in Germany to play the European Championship. And I played there uh, with the French national team, uh, U18, I think. And Rob Merce, who at the time was a scout, uh, picked the best players in that camp to invite them to what's called then the ABCD camp, which is a, a high school camp in uh, UC Irvine in California. Yeah, yeah, that's a famous one. Yeah. At the time, it was the biggest thing. You know, it was the biggest thing at the time. So we were invited there. Uh, a few players, a few of the players play, who played in that qualification tournaments. And... And, you know, my family just, you know, scraped the money, try to, you know, get me there because it was it was an experience that needed to be, uh, I guess, that needed to be lived. Like it was for us in France, I mean, at least for us from, so at least for us black players, because you have to differentiate in France, mm -hmm. there's, there's there's French white athletes and there's French black athletes. It, it's very, sure. as much as they're going to tell you that race does not exist, that cultural background is irrelevant, that, you know, France is a pay, uh, is a country, pays des droits de l'homme, a country of human rights. All this is just, is just poetry. At the end of the day, black people are going to identify with black people and white people are going to identify with white people. And culturally, the system was made so that we're not going to be treated the same. We're not going to get the same opportunities and whatnot and whatnot. So for black players in France, the college basketball in the U.S. was the dream, right? So, and, and you're thinking about a lot of kids, a lot of kids from, from Africa, because obviously France colonized a lot of African countries. So you do have a lot of African, originally African players from Mali, Senegal, Cameroon, Ivory Coast, who play basketball in France. And that's kind of who I grew up with playing, right? If, you, if you're talking about the urban and the cities and the big cities in France, uh, half the, a lot of the basketball players are going to come from these origins. And for us, it's more like, America was kind of the way to go. The Michael Jordan, the Magic Johnsons, the whatever, the black players is kind of where our sights were at. Um, so when I got invited to this camp, uh, it was, I mean, it was a dream come true. The whole family, you know, got together, helped out to give me a ticket to go there. Um, and I went there and, uh, and, and, I, and I handled my business. I, I guess I handled my business. Because from that trip, uh, which was my, the summer of my junior year in high school, I remember. From that trip, after that, when I went back to France, I started receiving letters. And I was getting heavily recruited. Because I was like, I think I made the all-star team for that camp. So I ended up being recruited by the best, the best schools in the, in, the, in the nation. Yeah, and you ended up at Michigan, which is one yeah. of the you know, blue blood programs yeah. in, in college basketball. Um, I know you played with a couple of legends there as well. So what made you choose Michigan? I mean, besides it being, of course, one of the best programs in the country. Well, it was, I mean, it was the, my five schools. My, it was down to five schools. It was Louisiana State, Providence, Michigan, North Carolina, and a small school in New York uh, called Iona, right? Because I wanted to see what a small school also would feel like. But at the end of the sure. day, that year, the finals was North Carolina against Michigan. So think about, yep. I mean, think when you start in hindsight, you're a French guy and you get and your top two schools are the schools that are basically in the NCAA championship. Right. So I, I was not dragging my feet, but I was taking my time making the decision. And what happened is Rashid Wallace took the last scholarship to go to North Carolina. And they had no more scholarships. Mm -hmm. So I had to say, hey, dude. So Michigan was then my second choice. Not really my second choice, but they kind of forced my hand 
And then sure, I decided sure. to go to Michigan. It was a little bit of one A one B there. It seemed like yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't go wrong. Like there's no right. I mean, at yeah, the time, I thought there was no wrong answer. I mean, mm -hmm. Providence would have been fine. I mean, any of these schools would have been fine. Yeah, I'm sure either way would have would have worked out for you. So, uh, I know you you stayed at Michigan for two years. Um, so, and then you of course decided to transfer to San Jose State. What yeah. what made you? Uh, decide to transfer was it just playing so time thing, was it you know? no the thing that's very interesting is when you come from where I come from I, I had a clear understanding that I had to work on my game I wasn't a good basketball player I mean I was athletic I could run I could jump but compared to who I was competing with I didn't have the skill set to do anything and I had aspirations to be better and Michigan is not a place where you can actually work on your game really I mean, you can work on your game, but I needed mm -hmm. like special attention, private times uh, to develop my skill set um, because I was pretty much an undersized. I was like a six 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 super athletic player who could get a rebound, you know, could hustle and whatnot. But I I I can dribble, can shoot. I mean, I didn't have a lot of technical uh, technical skills. So, and I realized that very early. Um, mm -hmm. so I told coach Fisher, who was the coach at the time at Michigan that, listen, coach, uh, I might want to look for a smaller school so where I can develop my game. And, um, and they couldn't understand that a guy from France who just came from Michigan, I remember clearly what he said in his office. He told me, I mean, this is the best thing that happens to a lot of people. How can you even like walk away from this? And I said, no, nah, I mean, I don't care Michigan or whatever. I have to get better. I have to improve. I need skills that, that you guys don't have time to teach me because we're busy trying to win games. I mean, this team yeah. was like trying to win national championships every year, right? They go to the tournament every year and they make a run, right? So mm -hmm. a friend of mine, a friend of mine who I met at the ABCD camp in, uh, in Irvine, the guy who was kind of my mentor, who was taking care of all the uh, European players who were invited at that camp, um, Keith Moss is his name. He's still my very dear friend to this day. Uh, he actually lives not far from you. He's in Roseville. Okay. Uh, and, and I called him. He was an assistant coach at San Jose State. And I said, listen, Keith, I have to get out of here. He's like, are you crazy? This is, this is the University of Michigan. Where are you going to go? <laughs> like, this is it. Like, it's like, I'm like, Keith, That's I need the top, to, right? Yeah. I say, you saw the, you saw the tape. You see me on TV. It's on TV. It's not like, you know, I need work. I need to work on my game if I want to make it to the next level. And so he said, all right, let me make a few phone calls and see what, what colleges, what schools around here, around where I am with people I trust have a spot. Right. So he started calling San Diego State, he started calling San Diego, he started calling a few schools, w, a lot of WCC schools and a lot of schools in mm -hmm. the area, a few schools in Texas, smaller schools, but with assistant coaches that he trusted. And it came very apparent that he was actually the guy that I needed. So at some point I told him, listen, my guy, you're at San Jose State, I know you, I trust you, I know you can help me work on my game, I want to go where you are. And he's like, well, we don't have scholarships. So we don't have a scholarship. So if you come, you're going to have to pay for school. And international tuition at the time was, I mean, it still is more expensive than in-state. Um, yeah. But I did take a visit. I did take a visit. I loved it. It was in the winter. And, you know, when you start seeing palm trees right next to <laughs> pine trees, right? Yep. And it's December and it's... 75 degrees 60 degrees you're like dude this is it this is the place yeah, it's, where it's this, winter in, in yeah, air quotes exactly in <laughs> like the, the, everything was great i really loved it i loved the school i love it's just, it was small enough it was under the radar enough so i decided to i decided to go there i decided to transfer to san jose state but i had to work i had to pay for school i had to get loans from friends and family friends and whatnot so it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at the beginning. Obviously you, you became a star after, I'm sure with some hard work and all that at, at San Jose State. Um, I saw that you led the Western Athletic Conference in points per game in 96, 97, and you took San Jose State to the NCAA tournament. I think that was just their, only their second tournament appearance in their, their history. 
so, you know, when did the NBA start to become like a realistic possibility for you? Probably my, my second year there. Uh, I, I did, towards the end of my first year, a few scouts came to the games and whatnot. So there was an inkling maybe there's something that might be happening. But you, but you never, it's never like my sophomore year there was like, it was great, but it was never like, yeah, he's a sure lock. He's a, but my second year, my junior year, um, it was better. It was better. Played better. I, I I worked very hard. Like I did extra time in the gym. Like people, you know, now everybody does like skill development and all that, all these shenanigans. Mm -hmm. I did be I on mean, Instagram everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's <laughs> out there doing well. If picture that two hours a day on top of regular practice, uh, we putting due diligence and and. At one of the practice, uh, the, actually, the head coach for the Sacramento Kings right now, what's his name? Uh, the guy who was at uh, the, Mike uh, Brown. Golden State. Mike Brown was a scout for the San Antonio Spurs. And he came, wow. to watch, he came to watch a practice. And after the practice, he told Keith, he said, yeah, this guy is no longer, uh, he's not a college player. That's it. He's reached the level where he's a professional player. Like, you can trust that if, he, if you guys come out after your junior year, there's a good chance you're going to get picked, right? So I was like, all right, bet. All right. So my, at the end of my junior year, I, I declared for the draft. And that was, not, that was not a foregone conclusion because there's an article that comes out every year. I think it's on Sports Illustrated or another publication where they list all the players that shouldn't have declared for the draft. And my name was on there. So I actually had to prove myself go to the Chicago pre-draft camp and, and handle my business there. So, you know, show that I was good enough to play at that level, uh, which I did to some extent. And then that's how Sacramento picked me in the, in the first round. You also work out with different teams, right? And, uh, you know, in my workouts, you could tell that teams were like, Atlanta was like, yeah, we have you at 23. I think they had the 23rd pick that year. If you don't work out, they say, if you don't go to Chicago, we'll pick you at 23. I'm like, yeah, nah, bro, I'm going to go to Chicago. Because if you're going to pick me at 23, I'm probably going to have a better chance getting picked higher uh, later. And sure enough, you know, you do your workouts, you do your stuff. The, the crazy things that people don't realize is that you have to drop your classes. So I had like 15 units I had to drop. So you got to you got to have to leave. It's like a you have to commit. Fully. Yeah, it's a commitment. Yeah. It's a commitment that is not, that is serious, right? You, you, you're taking a big leap. You know, as part of your pre-draft process, is there any other teams that, that you worked out for? And did the Kings make it known early on that, that they were going to pick you? N n not really, I, but I worked out for them last. The Kings were the last team I worked out for. I was in Cleveland, Atlanta. Uh, I did uh, Dallas. I did um, New Jersey. I did anywhere from the fifth pick to the twenty to the twenty third pick. That's kind of where that's what that was my range of workouts. You see what I'm saying? Because you kind of have. It's kind of brackets, right? Like you're not going to get invited by the Spurs who have the first pick, right? You know they're picking Duncan. It's a mm -hmm. done deal, right? But anywhere between eight, right? Toronto, eight. Toronto had the ninth pick. I worked out with. I worked out there, right? So that gives you an idea. Vancouver, all these teams that are probably in the range they think you're going to be at. I didn't know that Sacramento was going to pick me the night before the draft. That's when they called. Okay. And, and there's, a, a, there's a great story about this, actually. Great story. It's, it's a crazy story. When they called to say, yeah, we're going to pick you in the first round at 11, we're like, ah, oh, yeah, all excited and all that. Then we get another phone call two hours later saying, we got a, there's a problem. Your French team where you train when, from 16 to 19 years old, right before I went to college, is claiming that they have to get paid. Because think about oh, this. Okay. This had yeah. never happened before. A French player, actually, hell, a European player who hadn't had signed a professional contract in Europe had never been drafted in the first round. So I had signed a youth contract in Europe, but I never signed a professional contract in Europe. So my club in France were like, well, we trained him for three years. You owe us one point blah, blah, blah million dollars. They told this to the Kings. So... The night before the draft, dude, we are here freaking out. Everybody is, 
my mom's there, my pops there, my teammates, some of my teammates are there, my wife is there, everybody's freaking out. Like we're not going to, like something's going to happen, they're going to get scared, and they're not going to draft draft me, and then I'm going to be right, a second rounder or whatever, right? And sure enough, man, the Sacramento Kings, uh, you got to give them credit. They, you know, they held their ground. And that that case actually went all the way to the uh, to the uh, court of sports arbitration in Switzerland. It was oh, a wow. legal case, and now players who come from Europe, there's a there's a scale. So if they if they mm-hmm. say if they were in a club for one year, two years, three years, four years, depending on how long they were there, there's a scale and there's a number that an NBA club has to pay them. Right, but it all started with my situation where there was no rules regarding a European player coming with a youth contract straight to you know college and then straight to the league because mm-hmm. they never thought I would they never thought I was gonna make it. To be honest, <laughs> they never thought I was. They thought I was. They thought I was cuckoo in the melon. They thought I was crazy. I mean, I, I see. I know that's very common in soccer where they have like a sell-on clause, right? Yeah. If you leave when you're 16 to a big club and then they are kind of medium sized club and then you go to, I don't know, Manchester United, Real Madrid, whatever, your youth club will get, you know, 3%, 5%, absolutely, whatever. So, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I guess the, the f- framework is set up in, in soccer, but <laughs> it wasn't at the time in basketball. Time in basketball that time. Yeah. 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 And then around that same time, I, uh, you converted to Islam. So talk to us about, you know, what, what, it, what was behind that decision in terms of converting and what, what drew you to Islam? Yeah. So one thing, one thing that hopefully people who get to watch this, this podcast on, need to understand is France is ten percent Muslim. So ten percent that means that sixty five million people. There's six point five million Muslims. So you grow up with Muslims. This is not. This is not. Your best friends are Muslims, right? They're from Ni- uh, mm-hmm. Algeria, Morocco. Their parents are from Algeria, Morocco. Um, Senegal, you name it, Ivory Coast, you name it. Islam is part of French culture to a point where this country is going now, it's going far right like crazy because they can't, they're like, oh man, oh, okay, right? There's a lot of Muslims here. That's a problem. No hijab, eh, uh, no burkini in the pool, eh, no, I mean, they, you know, they start acting stupid. But so Islam was always part, it's always part of your life as a French citizen, whether you know it or not. Ramadan is celebrated, right? So a French regular person knows what Ramadan is because a third of the class is fasting. You you understand what I'm saying? This is not like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. this is nothing new, especially in urban areas where we're from, in big cities. Islam is a predominant cultural aspect of life. But how I discovered, well, I'm in college and whatever, and I had a very good friend, Mustafa Shukri, Egyptian brother, who, who was an uh, engineering student at San Jose State. And that's who, was a good friend, we talk a lot, spend a lot of time together. And, you know, I mean, you got questions. You spend time with Muslims, you're going to have questions. And I guess I, I was looking for the meaning of why are we here, you know, the meaning of life, the meaning of what... Why are we on this planet? Because you often ask yourself these questions around in your 20s, right? And uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was baptized. I was not religious in any way. But as an art history student, see, that's also the thing. The Roman Catholic Church is heavily studied. So we cl- I quickly understood that Roman <laughs> The Roman Catholic Church, it was a corrupt institution. Because that's kind of what you have to study. And so as you read books and you do research and you go, oh, man, this is, this, these guys are out of their mind. Like this is like they changed their religion and they did this and they did that. So there's a lot of few, there's a few things that push me toward Islam. But if I were to say anything, it would really be uh, Mustafa Shukri and his uh, patience, explanations, making me read the right books, making me presenting uh, Islam as the universal way of life that the creator had for his creation. Once you get to that understanding, then the Arab thing is not an issue. The, the, 
the terrorism thing is no longer an issue. Like you, you, you get a clear, I, I, I quickly got a clear understanding that this is, this is, this is the fitra of everything. Everything runs under. Everything submits to Allah's will, except us. We have a choice. June, you know, we have a mm -hmm. June, June and us. We have a choice. But everything else is in order, right? And so I was like, "No, that makes sense. That makes sense." Yeah. So yeah. I think so, that's a pretty pretty typical journey. It starts with a kind of a curiosity and a, a basic knowledge, and then it continues with a more personal connection or a person that introduces you to some things and you know is patient does some hand holding <laughs> to, uh, yeah to, oh yeah a lot of hand holding you know. <laughs> a lot of hand holding so that that was so 97 was a big year for you you uh, convert to Islam. you get drafted i believe 11th by the sacramento kings uh you become the first nba player uh raised in france so you're a trailblazer in that regard so you know what was the adjustment like in going from college and all your experience and then becoming you know professional basketball player in, in sacramento that's a big gap it's a big difference like you, you get to the first practice and you realize like oh damn these guys are good right you're thinking well i used to score like 23 easy on these guys now nah, these guys are as big as i am faster than i am more skilled more intelligent more savvy more Dude, I got it. So you, I, I was in a situation where I didn't have, remember, I basically learned how to play. Learn, when I say learn, I, I really want you guys to understand this. Like I only had two years of skill development. I mean, if you want to know how bad I was, just get on YouTube, watch a game from Michigan, 94. You're going to see a dude running around with his, with his head cut off, trying to get rebounds, running around like he's mad. Like literally. Like, literally. Like, I was looking at this like, dude, I was that bad? That's, that's not good. Right? And so, so I only had two years of skill development. So when you get to the NBA and you're, and you're playing against guys who've, who've been developed, they've been, right, they've been, they come from the country of the game, right? They, this is their country. They've been playing the right way since they were eight years old, Right? Wherever they're from, I don't care. I mean, they've been playing the right way since they were eight with coaches who know, with the, in the culture of the sport. That, do you understand what I'm saying by that? The culture of the sport. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't raised in the culture of the sport, even though my mom played, right? Even though I was in the middle of French basketball. But French basketball then was not what it is now, right? Now we've had, we put 30 dudes in the league, right? So the coaches are better. The understanding of the game is better. Me, I was the first one. So I come with my little amount of whatever, right? And I have to find quickly what I need to do to actually stick in this league. Because it's not, I don't, I, don't have the, I don't have all the tools. So I was like, you know what? I got to play defense. I got to play hard. I got to do the things that other players don't want to do. And I gotta, you know, and I and I gotta uh, do as much as I can. And but in yeah, hindsight, was, in hindsight, mm -hmm. like when I really think about it, because you get older, you look back, right? You're like, I destroy, I almost destroyed my health to get there. I don't know if that makes any sense. I had to almost overtrain to get there. Mm. And so, by year three. Yeah, three, year four, my knees are shot. My, I mean, everything is shot. Below the, below the waist, every, the hips are shot, knees are shot. So I had like, I don't know, five surgery while I was in the league, which is, which is, yeah, which is, we, we, right, which is too much. Like if you want to yeah, have a brutal. long career, it's, yeah, it's brutal because you got to come back mm -hmm. and all that. But, but the experience was, the experience was amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So was there a, a player, you know, when you're your rookie year or sophomore year that helped take take you under their wing? Perhaps I saw that you played with Mahmoud Abdul Rauf for a season yeah. in Sacramento. Did yeah. did having a, another Muslim on the team make that transition a little bit easier for you? Was he a mentor figure for you? No. Very strange situation. Very interesting, mm -hmm. but very interesting question. Um uh, Culturally, 
So how do I how do I put this? How do I explain this? Mahmoud is a great guy. Don't get it twisted. Don't get don't get me wrong on this. Good brother. Uh, I got along with him just fine. But culturally, I'm French. You have to understand. Like this is not like I'm not. Sure, sure. I'm not from Mississippi. I'm not. I'm 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 French Caribbean brother. Right. That's how. I'm a Muslim, of obviously, but I'm a French Caribbean brother, and culturally, I approach things very differently than a lot of white Americans, a lot of black Americans. I don't. I mean, I don't think the same. It's just different. I'm really in a in a in a in a small. I mean, it's it's weird. It's weird to say, but I. Right. So it, it, even though he's a Muslim brother sense. and we're on the same saying. team, mm-hmm. I mean, we got along just fine. Uh, we prayed together. We, you know, it's not like we, but you're here to get to get a job done. You're trying to save. You, you right. You're trying to sign that second contract. You don't. I'm not going to say you don't have time to make friends, but you got to be out here. You got to be out here grinding, right? So it's a very, very strange dynamics. Also, for you viewer, for the viewers. An NBA locker room, if you're not on a winning team, an NBA locker room is a testosterone nightmare. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I it's get a you. lot. Yeah. If you're not on a winning team, winning teams have less egos than losing teams. I've been, I've been on both. I've seen winning teams. I've seen losing teams. That makes perfect sense. Winning teams, as losing teams in Sacramento when I got drafted was not a winning team. It was on the way to be built as a winning team, but it was not yet a winning team. So the first year was uh, so and so. The second year was better because the player, obviously, the players were better, but their ego, the ego, was more team driven than it was individual driven. What about other guys like Hakeem and Sharif Abdurrahim? Like, did they, did you guys start forming like a Muslim brotherhood or at least just like staying in touch? Or no, no, we, just more like, so, you know, yeah, we're, we're so, about our business, we're grinding. No, 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 no. So when we go on the road, you, let's say you play, uh, you, you play at Houston. Hakeem was always a great host. Uh, I mean, a great host. There's no, like, we'd, we'd go to either, uh, uh, Fayez's house, one of his, one of the brothers there in Houston, we'd go there, sit, eat, whatever, talk, blah, 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 do our thing. Always, always nice. Uh, Sharif Abdurrahim also same, always nice. I didn't, I never, we never like went to each other's homes and ate or whatever, but always very nice. Um, but Hakim was the one really who set the tone like, yeah, guys, this is what, like, this is what we do. That's how, that's how you, right? And he was, no, great brother, mm-hmm. great brother. Uh, yep. But at the time, yeah. there were not that many. I mean, there were not as many brothers yeah. as now, I think. Uh, there's probably more now. Um, I also did play with uh, Mamadou Njai in Denver. So also, we were, I mean, we were close to some extent. So you could tell, though, obviously, that the brothers, Muslim brothers, they knew, we knew who we were, and we made sure that we went out of our way to make sure that everything was okay with the other brother. That's, that's a fact. Um, after that, it's uh, souls, ruh, the people you get along with, other people more than you get along with. It depends on the people, right? But but yeah. overall, I think there was, it could have been better. It could have been way better. Like, I think it could have been, I mean, literally, it could have been an NBA Muslim Players Association. Like, if we really, like, if we, if we really thought about it for a minute and sat down and mm-hmm. be like, and, and if we were smart about it, we would have created a, a, something that you're a Muslim, you come in, you know, everybody, you got everybody's contact, we help you out, you're on your way out, you're still in touch, do you need anything, da 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 doing it the it's right not way. not too late for that. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I, <laughs> see, I like the way you think, I like the way you think, brother. It's not too late for that, but if it's not in place, if something like this does not exist, it should exist. Absolutely. If something like this yeah. does not exist, inshallah, it should exist. Because I think it's big. There's enough players now in the league that the Muslims should be like, they should be communicating with each other. There should be something going on. Um, yeah, at the not, time, not it wasn't players, the case. But, yeah. but, but we yeah, all... have executives, uh, yeah. team team employees, etc. You know, we've interviewed uh, a brother that works for the Warriors. He's a manager of team development, I believe. There's an executive on the Warriors that, that is also Muslim. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, you're right. It's not even there. simply at the players' level. It's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, but then 
you know, we we when it's not happen, it's not conference, it not conference, mass events, we would see each other. Yeah, I mean, there's ways. There were ways that the Muslims in the NBA at the time were connected to some extent. But it could have been. It could have been way better. It could have been yeah, way better. Yeah, absolutely. And given the NBA lifestyle, was it was it particularly hard being a Muslim in the NBA? Like I know. You know, the lifestyle of NBA players, you hear about it. It's all this glamorous and they go out and they do things. And being a Muslim, was that hard for you? To well, kind of, I mean, I was already know. married in college. So for me, it wasn't really an issue as much as yeah. as whatever. I, mean, I don't know what other people were experiencing. But <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, yeah, I think you know. that's probably that's probably good for you that you had a wife. To yeah, keep absolutely. Grounded, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, I mean, I had, by the time I was a rookie in the league, I had a kid and a half. So by oh, the time, wow. by yeah. the end of my yeah, by the beginning of my second year, Amin was born in 98. So Amin was born in 98 and Hind was born in 99. So, I mean, right, you see what I'm saying? By the time I'm in yeah, Orlando, yeah, you're, I got you're more, two kids you're more set. Yeah, 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 yeah you're more set. Time. You're more grounded. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> and talk to us about like your playing career. Like, were there moments that stood out for you when you, you know, you're like, oh, you know, this is a great moment in my career, or, or there was this moment that you just really remember playing? No, the, 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 play, uh, the playoffs with Sacramento were great. The first year we went to the playoffs after a while and we lost to Utah in the first round. That was good. I think that was 90, I want to say 1999, 98, 99. That was good. That was the mm-hmm. shortened season uh, yes, where San Antonio won the title, I think. So that was, that was great. Um, then I was dry, I was uh, traded to Orlando. Uh, playing for Doc Rivers was good. It was really good experience. Bo Outlaw, um, Daryl Armstrong. I mean, these guys were these guys were men like good people. Ben Wallace. I mean, this this was my probably my best experience, my best basketball experience. Not only at the individual level, but at the team level. We had a team that was picked to finish last, and we fin- I think that year they finished eighth. Um, but my biggest regret, though, is that I didn't get to finish that year. I was traded to Denver mm-hmm. in the middle of that year, and then I went. So I went from a team that was coached uh, that was coached by Doc Rivers, who was an incredible. I mean, who was, who is, an incredible person, really, um, an incredible coach. Whatever. I mean, wh- whatever you think about this, me, my, I have nothing but good things to say about him. Uh, into uh, I was traded to Denver in a, in a in a in a franchise that was absolutely dysfunctional with players who I mean just just it was an abs I mean absolute yeah, shambles were, absolute yeah. shambles so to be honest with you to me it was almost like it was almost like the end like literally um Orlando we used to work so hard I mean it's just this, the culture was quality like hard work humble guys working class dude that had to prove themselves no names on the team everybody participated everybody worked to a team where at the time the guys were not I mean Denver was it was it was day and night it was just day and yeah. night it was day and night absolutely it really was absolutely. and I'm not talking about the level of the players, yeah. Uh, the, the players at Denver's, a good, they, they were good players. I'm not talking about the level of the player. But that's not what makes an experience. The level of the players is not what makes a team good. It has nothing to do with the level of the players. Everybody in the league can play. It's who leads, how do they lead, are the players willing to follow because the, lead, the leaders are righteous leaders, righteous quote unquote, I'm not talking about righteousness in the sense of <laughs> high level righteousness. I'm just talking about, is everybody on the same page? Are we doing this for the right reasons? So, you know, I mean, it takes three days to know if you're on a winning team or a losing team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what was it like playing in this era where, you know, do you have your Kobe's and your Vince Carter's and Shaq's like these really mega superstars? What was that like for you playing against some of these guys? Well, for me, it's not fun because I got I'm the one who got to guard them. <laughs> you talking about? Yeah. Uh, it's not yeah. fun. It's not yeah. fun. And All right, Tariq. Who would you say is your today. toughest hold guard? Hold on, hold on. This one was funny. All right, Tariq. T- so you remember Jason Williams, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, White chocolate, White chocolate. Right? Bad boy, yeah, bad us. man, a bad man <laughs> from the from the hills of West Virginia, the blackest white dude I've ever seen. 
<laughs> out of his mind. He's out of his mind. This kid was out of his mind. We go to Philadelphia, and I mean, obviously, right? He's like six feet. Iverson is six feet. He's matching up with Iverson, right? That's what I'm thinking in the sky. I mean, at a team meeting, I'm going in there like, ah, we good. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to follow Aaron McKee around. I'm good today. It's going to be a nice little day. I'm on Aaron's going to be, he might give me 12. You might give me 12, 15 points. But I can, I can control Aaron McKee. Man. Okay, Tariq, so we're going to, huh? We're going to put you on Allen. I like, say what? You're going to put me on who? So, even at 6'6", you got to guard. So, if you're the best, if you're quote-unquote the best defender on the team, you got to guard the best offensive player on the team. And so, it's, if, <laughs> so you got to follow Iverson all night. And you got to make sure that you don't get crossed over and end up on, a, on, a, on, a, on an ESPN highlight. And you got to make sure that he doesn't go for 40. You got to make sure he doesn't go for 50. Because these guys, some of these guys can go for 50. Right? So you yeah, got to try to see if you can get the, the, shooting pers- the, the shooting percentage down. So it's not even the points. It's like, yeah, if he scores 25, but he scores 25, at 25 points at 33%, you kind of did your job. Uh, if you limit his assists, then you, 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 you give him a little like a turnover assist ratio that is decent. You did your job. But that's the toughest job on the. Uh, that's the toughest job on the court, because yeah, you know uh, you have to. Sac- yeah, you're sacrificing your offense because you're not going to score because you got to chase this dude around. So you got to save the energy so he doesn't score fifty. So you can't think about oh I got to get mine. That's not a thing, right? So no, it's 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 horrific. You got Ray <laughs> Allen, you got Kobe Bryant. Uh, I mean, you name him. Allen Ivory, you name them. Yeah. Name them in the 90s. Yeah. All the two guards, A.D. Jones, all these guys are just a Reggie Miller, Allen Houston, and mm-hmm. you got to chase them around, picks and whatnot. Oh, Jesus who, Christ. Disgusting. Who was the toughest guard for you? Who would you Actually, say? Actually, the, like, Ray Allen. Ray Allen, okay. What, what made him so tough? He does not acknowledge your presence. When, when you're on the court, he does not acknowledge your presence. So he's the only... <laughs> You guys are laughing. You think this is funny. He's the only guy who comes off a screen, rises up to shoot the ball, and he does not acknowledge your presence. Wow. You are not there. You are literally not there. And that's how he's, that's how he's clutch like that. I hated wow. playing that dude. I hated playing. He always gave me numbers. Uh, Kobe obviously was giving me numbers, but it's Kobe. He's going to give numbers. right? I mean, it doesn't... To everybody. Yeah, it's, it's everybody's yep. going to pay. Didn't matter. You're going to pay. <laughs> but I didn't like Ray Allen. I didn't like A.D. Jones. He was very crafty. Very, I, I hated Reggie Miller. The war, ah, This dude <laughs> flopping all over the place, pushes you, falls down. He pushes you, he falls down. You have, I mean, you don't pay attention. He's kicking out at you. Yeah, he's, he's kicking, kicking you, you, he falls down. I mean, I'm like, bro. Stop, dude. I got to do what I got to do. I got to do what I got to do. I like, dude, I got three fouls in like in like eight minutes in the first, bro. What are you doing? Stop, man. Play the game. Just play the game. Uh, but it was fun. I mean, it's fun because it's when it works, like when you go out and you know you did your job, it is, there's no glory in it. Only a few people recognize that somebody's doing that job, but it's done and you win the game. It's cool. Mm-hmm. I think in this era, you'd be known as a, a three and D guy. And I think you would get a little more credit perhaps than, than that era. Well, right? the problem is I wasn't shooting threes. So I would have Not to learn time, how to right? shoot threes. That's the problem. Yeah. That's why mm-hmm. you see what I'm saying? Cause you got to bring, that's why three and D guys, uh, what's his name? We invented that position. Uh, what's his name? Bruce Bowen. Bruce Bowen from San Antonio. He could shoot threes, both well, from the corner granted, but he could shoot threes. So all of a sudden, you 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 have remember in the NBA you have to be able to score points. Uh, so three and D makes sense. Two and D eh, with the modern game, eh, maybe not as much. Um, but then again, now the rules the rules have changed, right? So you can't really yeah, of course, you can't really guard anybody like you could in my days. <laughs> it, yeah, gotta, it's, a different, off, right? yeah, it's a very different. Yeah, it looks like game. a different sport almost, yeah. even just from 20 years ago with the evolution of the three and all that. Uh, 
So, I mean, of course, you, you earned that reputation and seemed like not maybe perhaps fully by choice as the defensive stopper. But, you know, what, what was your approach to the game that I know you talked about? You kind of had to overtrain and really work on that aspect of your game. But what was your approach that you think made you so successful in that regard? No, well, I mean, you got to do your homework on who you're playing against, right? So a little bit more film, a little bit more, because it's more, you, you're going to be more in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I understand, huh? in the regular season, nobody's playing defense. Nobody's playing defense. So if you're the only one playing defense, you got to understand, I mean, there's probably two players, three, maybe three, maybe on the good teams, right? So there's the team defense aspect, so you got to make sure you're in the right place to help your teammates, but you're more of the individual one-on-one -on -one stopper guy, so you kind of have to pay. So the, the tendencies of your opponents become very important. Um, you will sacrifice someone else scoring, so you have to know when to pick your spots, like when to let someone else score and sacrifice. You have to kind of, sometimes you don't go help. Sometimes you stay on your guy, even though the scouting report says uh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Because the last thing you want, the last thing you want is for your guys to go, your player to go three buckets in a row. Because the guys you're guarding, they make three in a row, they make nine in a row. You understand what I'm saying? If they make three, they can easily mm -hmm. go nine for 11. Like that, very quickly. So the goal was always disturb momentum for that particular player. Never give him a run. That was the goal. I trust me, I did not. I did not always succeed. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be honest with you. But where I failed was really, really like the like the top notch, like the guys that like you know the Kobe's and the and the McGrady's. You know those dudes are like another yeah, level. Yeah. Of, another level of bucket getting. There's only so much you can do. You just kind of have to make them like work hard for it essentially right yeah exactly Just disrupt them a little bit exactly. get them off their spots you know that kind of to do some ball denial and hope that you know maybe they're having an off shooting night or something exactly because nobody's coming to the game thinking oh i'm a fan i want to see uh tariq lock up kobe tonight nah, that's, not, <laughs> that's not what they well, pay maybe he would have. <laughs> yeah maybe yeah you two of you guys yeah but you know what i'm saying that's not what they want to see yeah uh so you talked about how you had you know, five surgeries and you had a lot of issues with, uh, you know, your lower body. Um, so I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that your career ended somewhat prematurely because of these injuries. Yeah. So at what point did you start thinking about, you know, what am I going to do next after, after the NBA? No, you don't, you don't think about it like that. You don't, I'm, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think about it like that. I just went, I just, you know, you know, you, you wake up one morning and you know, your legs are going to give out, but I never had like a plan. Uh, like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's more like making sure you take care of your kids, making sure, you know, you take care of yourself. Um, transitioning into civil life, uh, is what it is. I mean, alhamdulillah, there was never, listen, there was never, how do I say this? So that you, so you guys get a clear understanding. Um, when I was at Michigan, I used to play with a, a guy who, after transferred to North Carolina, his name was Maktar Njai, right? He's a scout for the Knicks now. Good dude from Senegal. And we were at Michigan and he asked me a question one day. I, was, he was, I think he was going to a party, and I was walking back from somewhere with my friends to the dorms. It was late, like 12, p, you know, midnight, around midnight. And that's before I'm a Muslim. Huh? That's before I accepted Islam. And he looked at me, and he's like, I don't understand. Why do you act like a volleyball player? Hmm, okay. Do you know what that means? No. <laughs> that means I was never in the parties. I was never, oh, yeah, Michigan, I play for this, I'm this, I'm that. Mm. No, dude, that's not, that's not how I was raised. Like, who the hell do you think you are, bro? You ain't done, you ain't nothing. We're just, that's before I'm a Muslim. I'm not even like, I'm like, bro. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's the French education or I don't know what it is, but I was never... I never, okay, you remember that 
saying that we say the elephant does not the elephant does not leave a mark on the ground, but you're going to walk on it with arrogance. The mm. elephant, yeah, when he yeah. walks on earth, does not leave an imprint, but we're going to walk around with arrogance. So I was mm. never arrogant. That's not that's not that's not how I was raised, right? So on top of that, you add Islam. And you mix that with early retirement, eh, no big deal. You go back to regular life, dude. You treat, I always treated people normal. So to me, it was not, to me, to go back to post-NBA life was never an issue. Because I was never, because mm. I never, to be honest, I don't think I ever acted like an NBA player anyway. Because I've seen NBA players out mm. there act sometimes. You go like, whoa, bro, you need to calm down on this one. This dude's just here to help out. He ain't trying to, hey, yeah. We're not, why, like, why? Why? Yeah. Why? What makes you think, I mean, especially in this country, especially in this country, what makes you think that you're anything? Black people used to be property in this country. Not 200 years ago. What are we talking about? You're going to walk around here with arrogance? Where these people, 200 years ago, they, they gave you your rights. They gave you your rights in 1960? In 1966? No, I'm just saying, like, like think, put this in a perspective mm -hmm. where, yeah. and, and that's the perspective I always had. The NBA is the sport. You play a sport, you enjoy it. And Vlade Divac says this, said this to me one time. It made a lot of sense. He said, I can't believe these people are paying us millions of dollars for something we would do for free. That's very insightful. Yeah. We would play basketball for free. So And a lot of people do. <laughs> exactly. So stay like stay level. Stay level headed. So that's what I think that's what helped me in the transition into, into what I'm what I'm gonna call civilian life. Yeah. Where no, nah, you got kids. I had three kids at the time, a wife. Alhamdulillah, good a good way to start life. I've learned my lick. I mean, I've taken my licks on. Don't get it twisted. Don't think that I didn't experience things that were not, like, hurtful. Like, you know, get scammed by a few people, my money here and there, get this, the family starting acting different. All these experiences were lived, were experienced. All these things happened. But there was not a big, there was not a big dip because I never thought I was anybody anyway. Yeah, and I mean... We talked before we started recording that we would see you around the mosque and you would volunteer your time at, you know, some on Sunday school, for example. So we definitely saw that approach that you took where you kind of were just like, yeah, I'm just a normal guy who happens to be an NBA player. And I think uh, growing up as, as young Muslim kids and seeing that, I think we definitely appreciated that that approach and definitely saw you as, as, as a role model figure. Uh, so I think after you left the NBA, you started looking into coaching. I think you were an assistant coach uh, with Cal State Monterey Bay and then became a high school coach in San Jose. What made you pursue coaching? Was it so, you know, wanting to lead so young men funny, and women? So, funny. so the way <laughs> this is funny, the, the backstories are funny, always funny. Mm -hmm. So my daughter was like tall, uh, athletic. My boys are like a little bit shorter, athletic, but not as my daughter was like, and she was playing uh, NJB basketball, which we have in the Bay Area. NJB basketball, they're little, like a bunch of little sixth graders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my wife is like, come on, dude. I cannot go to these games. And these coaches don't know what the hell they're doing. You are here sitting on the couch. Netflix maybe just came out, just DVDs. I was ordering DVDs, watching DVDs. You know, at the time, Netflix was DVD. You ain't doing nothing all day. Go coach your daughter, dude. Go help these people. They don't know what they're, they don't know what they're doing. Go help these people. I, 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 whatever. So I went, and sure enough, there was a group of girls. So I went and coached that team where my daughter was on. And there was this little group, of little clique of girls from this little posh neighborhood in San Jose called Willow Glen, right? They're like, oh, we're getting coached by a, we're being coached by an NBA player. Wow, that's great, right? And the parents were like, whoa, this is different, like, this is this is it. Like we can't like and the kids, the kids love basketball. And they're like, 
Okay, Tori. So we we playing and we we start winning. We start doing decent, right? We start winning a few games, and at some point the parents go, "Would you create a program for our kids, for our girls, where because they love the game, they want to learn, they want to get better, and maybe that could be opportunities for them to you know play high school basketball, like let's say, right? Oh yeah, whatever. I mean, I'm in the neighborhood. It's not like I'm I'm there. Like everybody lives like in a three mile radius. So I basically created a basketball program for girls, like an AAU program for girls. But at the, at the start, it was for these girls, like six, seven girls. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, year after year, the program got a little bit bigger. People heard, you know, word of mouth, people start coming. That's how I got into coaching. Then uh, a friend of mine goes, well, you're doing good with girls. You know, there's a there's a spot at uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. They need you. You know, there's a coach who's looking for a coach, an assistant, uh, your background, blah blah blah. So next thing you know, I got my little my little thing like with my girls, and then I have a I'm coaching. A, uh, yeah, there was Division Two NCAA basketball. I'm an assistant. Great experience. We win. I mean, it's fun. It's fun. These coaches, these two ladies, my these two ladies, the the, the head coach. Um, uh, Rene Jimenez, just absolute like beast, like good basketball mind, understands the game, good coach, like great experience, right? So then Rene is like, after a year, she's like, well, there's an opening at San Diego State if you want to, you know, step up. The... And I'm like, okay, let me think about it, uh, blah, 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 let, let's see, blah, blah, blah. And then one of the parents, so then my girls are like, I'm like, yeah, guys, I think, yeah, I'm going to have to, I might leave. Right? I might literally, like, move on and take the college coaching route. And the mom said, no, nah, you have to stay here. You can't leave the girls. <laughs> like, you have to stay here. And there's this job at Lincoln High School, if you want to take it, take that job, but please stay with the girls, especially my daughter. Like, this lady was like, don't leave my daughter. She loves the game. She wants to get. She wants to play college ball. Please don't leave my daughter. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I took the job, and plus San Diego. I mean, you know, I would have to leave my family in San Jose, all that, whatever. whatever. So I said, all right, I'll take the job at Lincoln, and that's how I ended up coaching Lincoln High School. It's because I needed to be in San Jose so I can coach my girls. I mean, basically, that's what that's what it was. Can coach this group of girls. And so I was, and it all started, all started thanks to your wife. No, absolutely. Right. Yeah. What are you doing sitting there? You basketball, Mr. You know, basketball. Why don't you go help somebody? Right. That's how it started basically. And so by that time, San Jose, Lincoln, I didn't coach Lincoln for long. It wasn't actually, it wasn't a good experience. Like it was like to the players were recreational players who thought they were, like, going to go D1 or something. It was weird to me. Like, you know, a lot of parents who thought their kids were, I'm like, there's nobody here. Like, calm down. This is just high school basketball. This is not, no one here is going D1. Like I said that, it was like, uh, who do you think you I'm like, bro, <laughs> D1, did you understand? 6'6", 220. Is anybody here 6'6", 220? No, nah, so calm down. I mean, that, so... So Mon and I actually went to the rival high school, San Jose High. So we, I think we understand the level of play that was happening at, at that league. Right, and, sure. and we beat you guys every time we played you too. So you guys were even worse than we were. by a lot. <laughs> we were worse, you were worse than we were. So you know exactly what I'm saying. It's like a bunch of little mm -hmm. short dudes running around having fun. Now, there is nothing wrong with that. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. But the parents were a little disconnected with what was really going on. And the girls I was coaching on the side were, like, dedicated to the game, right? So they actually were not playing because their girlfriends wanted them to play just for basketball season, right? The guys don't play the whole year, and then basketball season, they want to play. These girls were playing year-round. And out of that group of kids, out of this program, a lot of girls went on to play college ball from D1 to D3, which, is, which, is, which was the point, right? Which was the point? So, what are you up to nowadays? Uh, what what what, uh, what what things are you involved well, in now? After Lincoln High School, where I was coaching basketball, I was gonna I was gonna start like I was done with it. 
the AD at Lincoln said, you got to stay. We need you on staff. You cannot leave. You have to coach something. We need you here. You have to coach something. And my kids did play tennis. My youngest was a tennis player, still is. And my daughter had transitioned from basketball to tennis. So I was like, he's like, yeah, we need a tennis. He said, your kids play tennis. Why don't you coach tennis? I was like, all right, bet. So I took the program for the girls and started the program for the boys just as a, as a fill-in coach, right? And I've been doing that ever since. Like it's been like eight, seven years maybe, eight years. So I've been doing that ever since. So, I, so now I'm really, in, I mean, I'm, I'm involved in tennis. That's why I coach tennis at the high school level. We organize tournaments to fund our, you know, high school programs. We, we're busy in the, in the tennis game. Yeah. And I mean, you, you've also been, you talked about being an art history major and things like that. And I, I see that, uh, you know, from your Instagram profile, you're still somewhat involved in the art world. Is that correct? Yeah, not as much as I, not as much as I want to, because it's uh, actually so the art world works like this in order to actually get a job to be there's being involved and being involved. Right. So if you want to be involved at the high school, like we're going to compare it to basketball, right? If you want to be involved at the high school level, junior college level, you know, you get a bachelor's and you're good to go. If you want to get involved at the NBA level, you know, like creating, cur- creating top-notch levels, art, work in auction houses, uh, uh, work for top museums, whatever. it's PhD level. You have to have a PhD. I did not actually do my grad school in art history, I did it in sports management. So I kind of shift, shifted a little bit. So I'm involved at a very low level, at a local level, let's say, right? Um, love photography, try to get stuff done in that, but, n- but nothing, nothing to write home about. Um, but, I do, but I do enjoy what's aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, that, that's for sure. Um, and... And it's, uh, how do I explain that? Uh, art is kind of the last, it's, art and sports are funny that way because they, they are and they should be the last thing, right? Once you took care of everything else, education, job, uh, uh, security, family, all those stuff come kind of before it, before it right? Um, sports can be included in that, in the important things in life, because it actually can provide upward mobility, right? But art is super exclusive. Mm -hmm. For upward mobility to happen in art, it's a very, it's exclusive. Everything about it is exclusive. Sports is way more inclusive. So you, you can be a sixth grader who loves basketball and end up, um, and end up going to the school of your dream because you can ball. You see what I'm saying? Uh, in art, I mean, you're going to have to get to the big time for it to impact your life. Whether you're at the artist level, the art historian level, the dealer level, the auction house level, the museum level, only NBA level artwork get to reap the rewards if you guys see what i'm where i'm going with that well thank you brother it was really appreciate you know we really appreciate your time this was incredibly insightful um as we shared a few times during the podcast and before the pod i mean we we grew up watching you we grew up uh rooting for you especially as one of the few muslim players in the nba uh you're definitely a role model for us on and off the court growing up so we really really appreciate no no problem it was my pleasure you're very thank you for your time you're very welcome very welcome Once again, thank you so much to Brother Tarek Abdul-Had for spending some time with us today talking about his life and career and sharing some of the incredible pearls of wisdom that he's picked up along the way. He was one of our favorite players growing up, um, primarily because we identified with him as a fellow Muslim, which is, uh, of course, was rare in the NBA. Now it's a little more common, but it was a lot of fun talking to him, and we hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, Make sure to follow us on all these social platforms on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On Instagram and Twitter, we are at 4040VisionPod, so we're easy to find. And we should be on all of the major podcasting platforms, so make sure to check us out 
uh, follow, like, download, subscribe, etc. on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, all of the above. So we appreciate you guys. Thank you for checking us out. Peace. <laughs>